Welcome to Toucan. For everybody who hasn't been on here already, this is the new platform for networking among virtual communities. So you'll see that a bunch of people are hanging around in this space. You aren't automatically dumped into a conversation with them, so there's no real awkwardness um, that's associated with kind of more traditional video conferencing platforms. Instead, you can click on somebody who's in the space and you can create a group with them or you can join an existing group. All you need to do is hover over the person or group that you want to join and then click the join button. And that way you'll come together just like you would in a you know, in-person event. So that's Toucan. We're going to be playing around with it a little bit more, um, but I highly encourage you to just link up with somebody here in the space and watch the event together. You don't have to talk with them. If you wanted to have a side conversation, you could, um, because that's how Toucan works. So we just want you to, to have the best time possible. So without further ado, I... It's my pleasure to announce our speaker today. So Eric Martin is a community professional with decades of experience leading, building, and shaping different communities. And he was the first community manager at Reddit and later became general manager. And then he took his experiences from there and applied them to working as general manager of Depop, VP of member engagement at WeWork, VP of marketing at Airtime, um, lead entrepreneur at Nike and chief community officer at Teal. So he now works at Comsor as vice president of services. So I'm really excited to ask him all about his work experience and his experience leading communities. So I'm going to welcome him up onto the stage. Um, and please, as he comes up into presenter mode, everybody give him all of the all of the claps and all of the love. Perfect. There he is. Hi, Eric. Hey, how's it going? It's going to, uh, wonderfully. Better now that you're here. How are you? Oh, I'm great. I'm great. Excited to chat about community, which is, uh, yeah, definitely my favorite thing to uh, talk about. So excited to, uh, yeah, get to meet some new people. Uh, always fun on the 2K platform. And yeah, excited to talk about community stuff. Well, we're so happy to have you. Why don't you kick this off just by talking about you and your background, um, how you got started in community in the first place. Sure. Yeah. So um, I uh, started working in community. I, I uh, grew up in North Carolina and was just getting out of college when sort of the first dot com wave uh, was hitting in the early 2000s. Um, and so got to work at a bunch of different startups. Some of those had sort of uh, community elements there. So uh, also it was just um, I was a big and, and still am a big film nerd, uh, uh, which we'll probably uh, reference reference later. But uh, I was really into, you know, sort of smaller independent films, documentaries, foreign films, things like that. Uh, and there were just starting to be places online where you could find other people who not only had heard of some of these films that most of my friends hadn't, but, you know, places to talk about them, places to sort of uh, geek out on, on, you know, Korean thrillers or, uh, you know, small documentaries from the 60s or whatever. Uh, and so that was sort of my, you know, the IMD me message boards, I know, were a, uh, were a big sort of uh, first community for a lot of people, um, you know, who were, who were online around that time. Uh, same for me. So that was probably the first, like, big, uh, you know, massive message board I was a part of. It was super fun. But there were smaller communities, uh, message boards and stuff locally as well. So I kind of got in through my you know, sort of uh, passion for for film and, and music and entertainment. Um, just to clarify for a second, well, two things. First of all, can you can you see me? Is my connection kind of yeah. choppy? No. Okay, no, everything's sure. good. Um, because I was just informed that that may have been the case. And then the second thing is, if anybody else has any questions, this is a super informal kind of discussion. I forgot to say this right at the beginning. So if you have any questions, put it in the in the global chat and then I will call on you to come up and, and ask your question or raise your hand. Um, you can do that by hovering over your uh, own video and then clicking the raise hand icon because we want to get everybody involved. Um, so Eric, then how did that 
kind of translate to a career for you? Um, it started yeah. as a passion. Now, how does it translate to a career? And um, also a follow up question to that is, do you ever do you ever feel like that passion is kind of become a bit of a burden because it's a career? Um, uh, that second one's a tough question. Um, uh, the, the short answer is not in the same way that other passions and careers have um, uh, worked uh, at, at sort of cross purposes. Um, you know, so for example, my I, I super passion about film and actually how I got involved in communities is I started working on uh, marketing. I, I was doing production and video editing and then uh, started to realize like, okay, we had these amazing projects, whether they were films or, you know, early streaming video things, um, but no one saw them. So started to get involved just kind of out of necessity in the marketing side. So started to market, um, do early online marketing with films. Um, again, these were small things without a budget. Um, and then uh, moved to New York and started working for a sort of film distribution and uh, music label there. Uh, so started doing that professionally, um, which eventually led me into communities. But, but you know, my experience with sort of uh, combining your sort of personal passion with professional sort of career path, uh, there was a period when I was watching multiple films per day um, and going to music, you know, concerts and small venue shows uh, in the evening. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I wanted to do during my free time was watch a movie or go see a concert like that. You couldn't yeah. drag me. It, it was, it felt like work. So uh, eventually, you know, kind of got over that. Um, but uh, I never had that kind of feeling with communities. I mean, I, you know, still, even when I was, uh, uh, you know, even when I was working at Reddit, um, I would still go on, you know, uh, you know, subreddits related to, you know, my, whatever the college basketball team I follow or, you know, for about some city I was traveling to just to sort of as a, as a consumer, as a, uh, so I, I don't know, I never um, had that same type of feeling with communities. Um, you definitely can't sort of unlearn the things you, you learn and see as a community manager. So you kind of see the brushworks and see some of the choices that the, that the creators and community managers have made. And, you know, it's hard not to, um, even when that gets in the way of enjoying it as a, as a member, as a user, um, it's hard to turn that off. But I never had that um, almost like animosity towards uh, combining things that I had in terms of film. So, um, but yeah, getting involved in community. So, I mean, I when I was doing marketing projects, again, these were projects that had, you know, we may have had a $5,000 budget. For big project, we had maybe a $10,000 budget, mm -hmm. for marketing, which is very small for, you know, when you think about most of the movies you see in theaters, or even the ones that you know are sort of promoted on Netflix or whatever, uh, they have budgets in the hundreds or millions, even for you know non-blockbuster stuff. So it was like, how do we do a lot with a little? And this was sort of early days of early days of social media, and but there was a lot of you know blogs and message boards. So mm -hmm. if I was marketing a uh, you know a sort of gritty political documentary, I would the best place to go for that was where there were people who are really into gritty political documentaries. Um, if you were marketing a record from an amazing Ethiopian singer, uh, it's going to be really hard to, um, you know, to get people to take a chance on the genre of music they, they hadn't heard. So you would go to where people were following, you know, other, other people in that genre. So I sort of approached communities from a marketing standpoint. Um, just around people who shared a, a, a passion for a specific type of uh, film or genre. Um, and yeah, got a lot of those communities were super, super welcoming and uh, really great as a, as a user um, as well. And if you had a new, uh, you know, film or project that, that was in that sort of realm, uh, people were really excited to talk about it. That doesn't mean they always liked it or went out and bought mm -hmm. tickets or, or bought, the, bought, the, uh, bought a copy of it, but they were at least uh, eager to, to learn about it. How did you go about approaching communities that you aren't necessarily a part of? So you mentioned a few kind of more specific or niche ones um, from a marketing perspective. Did you ever 
get a reaction from people that was negative because it was like you're trying to sell something to them and how has that shaped the way that you view community and, and approaching different communities yeah i probably um i definitely erred on the side of probably under promoting uh things i was you know uh, being being paid to promote uh, in communities uh so I always tried to uh be active in those communities uh you know before and and uh well beyond whatever the project was i was promoting um the good thing with or the thing that made this easier with those type of um with those type of uh films is there's usually a long lead time so usually you know uh it's kind of a little better today but back when i was doing this you know they're uh not you know uh films that originally came out in a market outside of the us usually they came out you know even if it was in the uk it would come out in the uk you know at least a year before it came out in the us um, mm -hmm. If it was a, a Southeast Asian film or a South American film, it might be two or three years before it finally came was released in the U.S. So the people, it was something, it was a project people were talking about before, you know, I got involved usually, um, and you know, usually I would, uh, you know, got a got a feel for what the community was like ahead of time. But uh, I, I would I would reach out to you know sort of the the creator or the moderators and just say, hey, I have a I'm working for this company, we have a new trailer. Is it okay if I post it? Is it, you know, so I would check mm -hmm. with them. And I was always, uh, I was never hiding that I was working for the company. Uh, and then if people had questions, I would try to get those answered from someone, you know, on the production, which sometimes I was able to do, sometimes I wasn't. Occasionally we would try to bring in someone from the film. Uh, usually it wasn't, you know, again, even for these smaller films, usually we didn't have access to like the director or the main star, but we could usually get someone, mm -hmm. maybe it was the person who did the score or, a set designer um, to come and, and chat with fans. So we try to do, um, you know, you know, sort of fan service there and share any sort of Easter eggs or set photos or any materials I had um, as well. But but again, these were sort of communities of passion. So usually it was um, people who were, um, you know, really excited to promote these projects. Um, so yeah, I. I last thing I wanted to be was, you know, too spammy or too uh, promotional. Um, yeah. But yeah. So definitely something I was aware of, but tried not to uh, try not to cross that line. You mentioned uh, just a couple minutes ago, Reddit. So you were the first community manager at Reddit. How did you go about building that role? Kind of what did you see as being the key problems that you needed to solve when you stepped into it? Yeah, so when I joined Reddit, it had already been around for a little bit. Um, it was still super small, so it already it had already been a Reddit has a weird uh, path um, by by today's standards. It, it had been acquired by Connie Nass like a year after it was created. It already had a pretty big audience, um, but was still uh, still had um, relatively few you know subreddits or or communities that were. Um, getting a lot of uh, a lot of traffic or activity, um, so I really saw it as like, hey, this is, is amazing, very simple, very flexible platform that um, you know the founders created and the original community helped build. Um, we've got to help it expand into more areas. So um, there were people, you know, at, in in the first year or two, it was like, wow, there's people that we know are really into gaming or are really into. Uh, you know, talking about, uh, I don't know, whatever, TV shows, uh, uh, politics that are active on Reddit, but they're going somewhere else to talk about those things. Um, mm -hmm. So it really became sort of expanding the audience, not in terms of necessarily new people, but in terms of let's create, let's help the subreddit, you know, creators and moderators um, grow their communities in new areas. So almost expanding like the the time that people were spending on site or the different topics they were talking about. So a lot of that was uh, internal promotion, you know, making sure everyone was aware of, hey, we have these gaming subreddits or we have these local subreddits or whatever the case was. Um, but then it also uh, became like, let's let's make sure, um, you know, we uh, make sure we're, you know, doing doing projects, doing events, doing contests, doing sort of community events um, with those uh, existing communities 
that are sort of overlapping with those areas of Reddit as well. Well, I think that that, I mean, that's such an interesting world to be in because Reddit is formed literally just to facilitate community building, um, but like more grassroots community building. So that's, that's a really good kind of first bit of experience and I'm sure taught you a lot of lessons, which is what we're talking about today. So just a, a question to kick this off, how would you define an established community? Like one that maybe has legs to stand on, on its own, but that could still use a little bit of guidance. How do you know when you've gotten your community to that point? Yeah, I, for me, the biggest sign of life and the most important thing um, uh, that was definitely present with Reddit. And when I looked at other you know, communities and companies to be involved with, um, it was the main thing I was looking for. And that's, uh, is, is, the, is the community invested enough and aligned enough with the, with the platform, with the space that they're starting to introduce their own ideas? So are members in the community pushing the, the shape of the community, the type of activity, um, are, are they pushing that with their own input? So do they feel, uh, you know, are in, in the case of in the case of Reddit, are they creating new subreddits or new ways of interaction that the founders and employees, you know, didn't necessarily have in mind, didn't think of uh, same when I joined mm -hmm. Depop. Like, it was a, it, you know, it was basic non, it didn't exist in the US and it was pretty big in the UK, but it was like, it was clear to me when I went on the platform, like, wow, the, for whatever combination of reasons, the users on this platform uh, took this thing that was originally intended to be a like, sort of like eBay type marketplace where you can buy stuff and sell stuff. And they added elements of uh, their own personality to it. They added, you know, stuff about themselves, about their lives, expressing their creativity in ways that weren't necessarily originally intended. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's the biggest sign that a community has has life. I mean, it's very qualitative, but uh, if are people starting to um, be creative within the confines of the community, whatever that is, is, is to me like the biggest signal that there's something here that's more than just the sum of the parts. That's a great answer. And Electra actually put a question that's a, a pretty good follow up to that in the chat, which is once you have community members, then what do you find is the best way to engage them? Because yes, it's ideal if your members are creating their own sort of creative ways to use the, the community right. and the platform, but you kind of need to put the kindling in the fire and, and sometimes you need to it a little bit so she said she's tried newsletters and posting on community boards but what have you found as being the most effective way yeah i i think the metaphor you use there kindling is is the the right approach so you know you you have and, and this is true you know with starting out sort of that that user driven activity uh, but I think it's true for other other sort of types of engagement you want to get in the community. If you don't have it yet, you have to help create it. So if your goal is to have people creating things inside the community, in this case, um, then you, you know, for the first to get that going, to get that fire started, you have to help them do that. So uh, I would say, you know, you know, if if you're doing a newsletter, um, you know, really try to involve the community in those in that newsletter, even if it's sort of you doing most of the work and you doing most of the heavy lifting to start. So that could be, you know, could be something simple like interviewing a community member. It could be helping them write a little blurb. Uh, it could be helping them host an event, whatever makes sense. It could be helping them kind of formulate their tips on how to use the platform the communities around. But you want to help like draw those things out of the early community members, which again at first may take a lot of work and it may take um, you know you doing most of the work and giving the the community member most of the credit. Uh, but overall, that example will be a behavior uh, model for the rest of the community, and hopefully, over time, you'll end up the the sort of energy you're putting into it 
will be picked up more and more by the community members. And eventually one day mm -hmm. you'll find, um, oh, wow, I didn't even have to post that thread asking people about uh, what are they celebrating this week? Someone beat me to it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's when you're like, okay, this thing has enough momentum on its own that I can sort of step back and, and let the community take over. So I think that's the, you know, you want to try to get it up to speed. And again, it can take a lot of a lot of heavy lifting and you doing a lot of the work at the beginning. But the idea is, um, you know, once you kind of show how it's possible and also show the community that, hey, if you have a really good idea, if there's something you want to do, um, we'll help you. And the, the you know, there is a space for you to do that and you'll be supported. And this is a you know great environment for you to try that out. Um, then that I think that really sends a signal to the rest of the community that isn't necessarily may not even be participating, but you know down the road they may have an idea and be like, oh yeah, this is a community where, you know, I can ask an important question or where I can share my ideas or where I can host an event. You know, even if it's just small, small Q and A inside one of the you know Slack channels or whatever. So I think that's important to kind of like you said, uh, you want to you want to be part of that kindling at first. So on the topic of participation, so member participation, how do you get people involved who may not traditionally be the loudest voices in the room? Um, just because people establish their own presence over time and and how do you help those that aren't as prominent who might want to be? Yeah, that, that's hard. That's a, that's a really good question and it's a hard thing I think we all deal with. And um, I, I found some things that, that help, but it's a, it's a sort of constant struggle and thing to be vigilant of. Um, early on, you know, when, uh, when the community is growing, you can have enough. I mean, when there's uh, a smaller number of community members per, you know, person working on it, even if you're a team of one, uh, then you have a little bit more flexibility. But uh, eventually you'll get to a point where there's just not enough hours in the day. You can't respond to everything. You can't have a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, 15 minute meeting with each new community member, depending on, you know, the, the type of community. So then you have to prioritize and the, the natural inclination, the natural sort of default is you end up spending time with usually yeah, the loudest voices in the room, which could be the people who are just the most active or it could be the people, especially if you have a sort of more support driven community, the people that are experiencing problems. Um, uh, the, the next sort of like user group that usually gets the gravity is, is the new people coming in, um, which makes sense. But those are the two groups you end up spending the most time with, uh, just if you let things run their course. And so it's really important to make sure you are carving out time, making time for those other users um, who may be having a, you know, perfectly fine experience. They're just not the, they're just not the loudest or the most active or the newest or uh, whatever, whatever the focus um, is. So one of the things I've, I've done that that is a small thing, but I think has helped me try to uh, recognize and be aware of those blind spots is I do a random member audit. So um, mm. I've done this in a very sort of like manual way uh, where, you know, if you have a, a list of, uh, you have a list of members um, or we have a database and each member has a unique number by them in, in most systems, um, even if you have to export it to Excel or something, you then, you know, if there's uh, 4,000 members, you use a random number generator and you say, give me three numbers. And then you reach out to the members yeah. that correspond with those numbers. Um, sometimes cool. there's tools that can help you do that. So for, I was a, I was a Comsort customer before I joined the team and I, told the team about this thing I was doing, said, hey, can you all build this into the uh, into the, the Comsor um, tool? And and they uh, uh, I was really grateful when they did. So if you use Comsor, nice. it's kind of built in. But um, I've always, what you'll find too is a lot of times, um, you know, those members are, are ones you don't know much about. You may not have much information on them in your system. They may not have posted very much. Um, they may have not been around in, you know, 90 days. So, uh, which, which, you know, even for super healthy uh, communities is totally normal. So it, it really helps you uh, be aware of what is the makeup of this community? Um, you know, even if that makeup is 80% lurkers or 90% lurkers, which is totally normal. Um, so uh, I, I found that to be really uh, helpful just in terms of approach. And if you do that, you know, 
if you reach out to one person, send them a DM or an email or whatever a day, uh, you know, that adds up after, mm -hmm. after six or 12 months. So you can really make sure um, you're at least carving out some time for the members that you wouldn't otherwise. And how do you make sure as your community grows and evolves, gets bigger, starts running itself, that the core values stay the same? Or can it be the case that once you have a community, and then it's better to let the values be you know, shaped flexibly by, yeah. you know, according to what members want? Sure. So this is where I, you know, sort of go back to my my film nerd roots um, and really think about, uh, you know, this term genre. I, I think it's, uh, you know, genre is not a perfect metaphor. You could substitute the word brand in if you want. Um, but I think uh, I like thinking about a community in terms of what is its genre, um, meaning like, you know, genre is this thing. It's a it's a combination of you know, setting and story and the uh, main characters and whatever. Um, but those, those that, you know, that particular combination um, is setting the expectations with the audience and the, the person creating it can, can play within those and, and, you know, have a lot of uh, invention and remixing and whatever inside that genre. But there's a, there's a set expectation with the community or, or audience in the, in the case of uh, films. So I, I like to try to figure out, um, you know, what is the underlying uh, uh, theme of the community? What's the what's the emotional reason people are coming? Um, and that may not be super clear. It may be multifaceted, but but really understand like, what is that? What is that emotional theme? What are what's the sort of personal intrinsic question that people are coming here to? get answered because it, there's usually something deeper even if it's subconscious and whatever there's something deeper than just oh i'm coming here to get answers about how to do the software integration that i have to do for work mm -hmm. there's something more if people are uh you know th that transactional sort of information can get people to to start interacting with the community or to sign up in the first place but that's usually not why they stay and why they invest the time there's something more going on so if, if you're you can figure out what that is um, and then think about the community's expectations in terms of what are, you know, what type of, what's the setting? Um, if we're again using that metaphor of genre and movies, what, what's the setting? Is it professional? Is it personal? Are people using this at their, at their, you know, workstation, whether that's at home in the office, or are they using this when they're in line for the grocery store or whatever? Um, I think those, knowing those underlying, you know, sort of human things helps you then figure out um, where that genre uh, can evolve and where it can't. So, I, I mean, I think, you know, core values, uh, basically it's, it's uh, you know, important and it's even uh, important to keep those and, and it's hard to change those once they're set for, for better and for worse. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you're, once you have a, a community, once you have, you know, messy, complicated, fascinating human beings in there, um, it, it's more of a conversation and a dance with the audience than when you're starting it out. So I think uh, mm -hmm. you have your core values and it's sort of your, um, you have the uh, 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 accountability for the space, even if you don't have complete control, but it becomes more of a fluid back and forth. Um, um, again, just like genre with the audience's expectations. So thinking about, um, uh, how that can evolve, where is it a, a natural fit, where is it going to be um, sort of dissonant to the, to the audience, um, to the community, if you try mm -hmm. to add something. Um, sometimes those, sometimes those uh, uh, evolutions or additions aren't obvious. Sometimes it seems, um, uh, you know, like, oh, this thing will definitely work because it totally fits in with, you know, where where this community is, but um, but then it turns out like, uh, oh, that's not really what the, I don't know, for some reason the, the community is not receptive to that, they're not into it. Uh, and usually when that happens, it's because of one of those sort of deeper emotional reasons. Interesting. So you mentioned, we were talking about this earlier, you mentioned that you may have um, an idea for an activity Yes. that we could all do together um, based on 
this kind of movie genre way of thinking about community. Do you want to explain, explain a little bit? Yeah. So uh, I thought it'd be fun to spend a few minutes if uh, everyone, um, we can create some uh, uh, yeah, rooms I'm on it. or tables uh, um, uh, with a few different common genres in, in entertainment. Um, and if people can just uh, join the ones that sort of speak to you. Um, and then uh, in those groups, we've got action, we've got comedy, we've got horror. Um, we have a few other sci-fi. Perfect. So go ahead and uh, we'll we'll take uh, take like six minutes here, and if everyone can join one of those uh, one of those tables, drama just got added. Uh, that's your favorite or that speaks to you. Um, introduce yourself to everyone else um, in that space, um, and then if you talk about what. Um, what do you think that underlying sort of emotional theme of of that genre is? So, um, you know, for uh, I, I know we don't have Western up there, so I'll use Western like Westerns. Uh, there's there's cowboys, there's vistas, there's horses. Um, but there's this, you know, sort of underlying themes around uh, independence, around, um, you know, self-reliance, around, uh, you know, uh, you know, some, some moral issues, right and wrong, things like that. The, those are, those are the un, sort of thematic underpinnings of, of the Western genre. Um, so uh, if everyone in your group can discuss what you think those themes are for that genre, and then we'll bring one of you uh, or more than one of you up on stage and we'll chat about it a little bit. And Eric and I will hop off stage so that we can participate in the conversations too, because we, we want to do the activity too. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll see you back back in a couple of minutes, but please just pick a group, meet some cool people, um, and we'll be back in, uh, in a sec. Yeah. Uh, Definitely. Yeah, when you're talking about emotion, um, and plus Ken mentioning time travel, reminded me of a show that I watched on Netflix a few months ago called Dark. And it's a undercover and watch it in a movie theater. Then you're watching people live, um, like either laughing or not laughing. freedom and room to jump in and add your own uh, add your own spin on it or focus on the elements that you find most, um, you know, uh, rewarding. Um, but yeah, in terms of sci-fi, I, I, I think about it in terms of, and I'm a big sci-fi fan, uh, although my favorite sci-fi film is probably Aliens, which I would argue is, is more action than sci-fi. And uh, I also love Mandalorian, which I would argue is more of a Western than a sci-fi, but uh, <laughs> like how, yeah. how it's yeah about like human nature and how we deal with new information and new technology, but, but by reflecting on that new thing that we don't normally have to deal with in our everyday lives, we hopefully learn. Hello. Um, so I hope you guys had good discussions. We're going to bring this back to our, our stage view here with Eric. Hi, Eric. Hello. <laughs> I hope the sci-fi sci-fi group had some had some good chats. Yeah, yeah, totally. Fantastic. Okay, so like I'd love to hear what you guys are talking about. I'd love to hear I, I'm sure you guys would like to hear what we were talking about. So um if there's anybody who'd want to come up and share a little bit about what went down in their group, give us a good recap. There we go. Thank you, Joe. And here we go. Here we go. I, I, I'm laughing because I know that first Eric was in, a, you know, was in the group with us, and he could he could listen as well to the discussion between us about who we're going to sign <laughs> to the stage. Um, so I think the first thing was, you know, talking about what we're interested in. So films, which films, which. Um, you know, intellectual property. We talked about a few things, including books, and then um, and then we talked about 
two maybe things that were important. Uh, the one are related to general humanity questions, survival being one of them, or emotions and so on. Mm -hmm. And the other one that actually Ken and uh, Andrew um, you know, brought back was about time travel. And actually what it brings is to the overall theme, to a role sci-fi um, mm -hmm. theme in general, you know, that in films or, or programs that we've discussed about. So those were the elements, sort of the mix of the, of, of the two. Um, Eric, to paraphrase basically what, what Eric said at the end, was um, that the purpose really of the discussion and the genre parallel between community and films was uh, the fact that nobody is right. It's just basically just a question of opinion and discussion. Mm. And what makes it interesting is actually the fact that everybody comes with their own spin their own perspective and um and just by doing that it brings richness to the discussion and to the community that's really interesting um i like the nobody's right piece of that um because i think that that's 100 percent true um and also we're we're coming to learn that that seems to be the way that our society works in general so as sci-fi as sci-fi films are, I think there's a lot of truth kind of baked into it. Um, does anybody from the comedy group want to come up and say a thing or two about what we talked about? To get on stage, just click the, the orange present button at the bottom. Doesn't need to be a recap of everything said. Perfect. Hey, Nina. Hey, uh, I decided to join because Antonia, I know how difficult it is to get people to join. Um, Thank so you. Hit the bullet there. Um, so in our comedy group, we, you know, started a little bit with. Oh, this is so cool getting all this reactions. Uh, started a bit with the obvious things with like, you know, you leave uh, watching a comedy movie or TV show uh, happier, laughing, just in a good mood. But then we also talked about the more subtle nuances of the vulnerability that it takes to uh open yourself up to that type of like comedy especially in stand-up comedy when you're presenting something uh, in front of a live audience you know like i am right now this is quite vulnerable um and we also talked about uh the character development and how you want to like feel attached to the characters because yes you're there for a good time and to enjoy it but you also want to have some type of emotional connection with the movie or tv show otherwise why stick around for nine seasons uh, so it's really important to just have that arc as well. Um, and I think those are the main points. We also got off topic a little bit, but it was still a good conversation. All right. Thanks, Nina. Appreciate it. All right, Eric, what do you what do you think? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, it was really cool to hear uh, the discussion in the sci-fi group and then also to hear Nina talk about comedy. Yeah, comedy. We all we all slip on the banana peel uh, pretty regularly. So uh, I think I don't know. Uh, one of the reasons I like watching comedy is, is you can sort of uh, laugh at yourself through through other people. This weird human condition we all have, um, which is what sci-fi is about, too. So I don't know I, I, I like this genre comparison because, yeah, like like I saw in the sci-fi group and I'm sure in the comedy group, there's a lot of different answers. They're all sort of right. Um, and, and there's space for all of those. Yet, we still have a clearly defined genre. The, the, there's And there's things that are combining genres, like we talked about Mandalorian is sort of sci-fi, but it's also sort of a Western. Um, but, but in general, th there is this container and the audience knows what to expect. If you watch a trailer for a movie, you know like, okay, that's a comedy. And as sometimes happens, if you go in and it turns out it's actually a drama and they just cut the trailer to make it seem like a comedy, you're not gonna, you know, you're gonna have a different experience. So you have this flexibility, this shape um, that has a lot of creativity and flexibility inside it, yet it also has structure. And if you, you know, when you're building a community, especially if you have one that has enough life to sort of keep it going, you have to figure out what's that right balance between structure and expectations and what, what the boundary is in terms of what's what's on the outside and what's on the inside, but also leave enough uh, flexibility in there uh, for the members of the audience, the members of the community to bring their own perspective, to remix it, to add things that you didn't even think of before, which is kind of scary because it, it, it's you're saying I'm creating something that I, I deliberately uh, hopefully won't have complete control over. 
Um, but I think, uh, you know, this metaphor of genre can kind of help. Uh, and, and again, there's no, there's no right answers, uh, but there are some recurring patterns and, and themes. And if you can figure out what those themes, what those emotional things that, yeah, like, like uh, Nina said, the reason why is someone coming to your community for nine seasons? Okay. They got the answer to their question. They met someone for networking, but why are they coming back? It's gotta be more than that. Um, and if you can get in touch with what that is, even if it's hard to quantify and, and even hard to articulate sometimes, then that will that will steer you in the right direction as far as how and, and, and where to grow it. That's a really fantastic point. And I just conscious of time, I think one last question that Michelle um, sent to me in a chat message was, for someone who's been building communities for years, what has changed the most over time? So either positively or negatively. Um, yeah, so uh, the answer I would say is one that's a bit of both. And that's just, um, you know, there's there's resources, there's money in the space. Um, when I was starting out as a community manager and there were people doing it long before I was, um, but there, there weren't there weren't, um, you know, the tools were were few and and not really designed for community. There weren't sort of industry resources like community club. Uh, you know, there weren't companies investing in community tools. There weren't amazing entrepreneurs and builders um, making things like Toucan to uh, and help uh, enable community interaction. So it's it's amazing that we're here now. It's amazing that uh, I was just doing research. There's like 50 just in the U.S. There's 50 new community manager jobs a week. Like actual, you know, the way we think of community management, not like wow. apartment building community manager, which is you know uh, no shade on that, but but it's different. So there's 50 of those a week that are being added. Um, that's amazing. Uh, but at the same time, it it's um, you know. I don't know. The, 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 uh, again, it feels like one of those uh, obscure film genres I was into. There was something special about when it wasn't well known and there were only a handful of people doing it. Um, I, I, I think we're in a better place now, but it is a little bit different. Um, and I just, yeah, I just think the tools like you can now have, uh, you can create a, a brand a product as a nights and weekends project, and you can build up a massive community without having to spend a lot of money or without having to know how to code, without having a huge audience. Um, that's happening. It's not, it's not easy, but it's, it was impossible, you know, 10 years ago. It was, it was really yeah. hard five years ago and now you can do it. So I just think that's, that's uh, yeah, it, it's really exciting to see what, what the, especially the, the companies that are emerging with, with the community there from the beginning. Um, that's really exciting. Cause I, I believe uh, in general, uh, you know, communities, help lead companies um in the right direction if, if as long as we're willing to listen to them um so uh, uh, it's exciting to see how co uh, companies with communities at the core that are really uh focused on on uh, letting their communities lead them will develop over the next you know decade or so that's a fantastic answer and i'm also really keen to see how that how that goes thank you so much eric for being with us today. This has been so much fun and thank you to everybody who came out. Thank you to everybody who participated. Um, it's so great to see you as always. And please keep up to date with Toucan events that are coming up because we always um, like to throw fun stuff for you guys and bring people like Eric to come and, and chat so that we can all learn a little something um, on this fun Wednesday. Like I said, if you have any tips, if you have any feedback at all, let me know. Um, but please, everybody give Eric one last kind of two-can round of applause. Um, thank you so, so much, and I hope to see you soon. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure meeting everyone, uh, and uh, yeah, super fun. Love, love the platform. So, Take care, everybody.